talked to Pastor Anderson on the phone about this, he, he told me that I was accusing him of being a polytheist. And I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I know that you don't believe in polytheism. I would never accuse you of being polytheistic. But what you're saying sounds polytheistic. When you say that Jesus is God, but he's not God the Father, you've got two gods in that sentence. <laughs> what we believe is not so crazy. And uh, the first one I went to is Isaiah 9, 6. I think it's one of the clearest verses in the Bible that Jesus is God. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now that child and that son is obviously Jesus Christ. No one argues with that. It's clear. It's super clear. And it says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So what the Bible's saying here is that the name of this child that is going to be born, the name of the son, is the Everlasting Father. And the guy, the guy that demanded the three verses, he, uh, I, I, I quoted this verse to him and he said, yes, but that's not the primary interpretation of that verse. And I said, yeah, but that's what it says. Now, if you want me to believe that the name of, of the son is the Everlasting Father, but he's not the Everlasting Father, that's a strange interpretation. That's a weird interpretation. These modalists, where the whole doctrine even came from in modern times, is from the baptism issue of baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost, versus in the name of Jesus only. That's where this whole modalist doctrine even comes from in the 20th century. There's an ancient heresy of modalism, but it was dead for a long time, and it was picked up again by the Pentecostals in the early 20th century, around 1914. But here's what's funny is that these modalist heretics in our church or these modalist oneness Pentecostals, here's what they say. Yeah, but what's the name of the Father? What's the name of the Son? What's the name of the Holy Ghost? They're saying that the Father is not a name. That's why they're saying there's no name revealed in the New Testament except the name of Jesus. So they're not acknowledging that the Father is a name. They're saying that's not a name, it's a title. This is what modalists teach. Father's a title, son's a title, Holy Ghost style, but what's the name? Jesus, because that's what they claim. But then all of a sudden in Isaiah 9, 6, now all of a sudden father's a name again. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In the New Testament, the Bible defines this for us since we don't speak Hebrew. It says, Emmanuel, what's being interpreted is God with us. Now, is that the name that Jesus was actually given when he was born? No, the name that he was given is Jesus. So why does it say that his name shall be called Emmanuel? Why? Because that is his attribute, God with us. He was God with us. So that's why his name's called Emmanuel. That's where Sam Gipp gets it wrong. These guys are making the same mistake. Go to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now, is Jesus' name really supposed to be Wonderful? Hello, my name is Wonderful? Think about that. Is that actually what this is saying when it says his name shall be called Wonderful? Is it saying that he actually is named Wonderful? No, it's not. Nor is it saying that his name is actually named Counselor. You see, wonderful is an attribute of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, is an attribute of Jesus. Counselor is an attribute of Jesus. And you say, well, where do you get that in the Bible? Because the word name in the Bible sometimes is referring to a literal name, but sometimes it means who they are, a reputation. You say, prove it. Okay, how about this? A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. What does the Bible mean when it says a good name is rather to be chosen than riches? It's not saying, man, Stephen is such a cool name. I'm so glad my parents gave me that name. Is that what it means? Or man, faithful word is such a cool name for a church. No, a good name is rather to be chosen than silver. It means a good reputation. It's who you are. It's what your attributes are your name. How about this one? He wanted to make a name for himself. Is it saying he's sitting down and designing a new logo with a new name for himself? No. If he's making a name for himself, it's what his reputation is. Genesis 11, where it says, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. 
and let us make us a name. They want to be renowned. They want to be well-known. They want that reputation. Deuteronomy 25.10, And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. Now, do you really think that it's saying that you walk up to somebody and say, Hello, house of him that hath his shoe loosed. How you doing, buddy? That's a mouthful. What it's saying is that his name shall be called in Israel. His name shall be called, same wording, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. What? That's what he's going to be known for. Oh, he's that guy who didn't raise up seed unto his brother. He's that guy who had his shoe loosed. He's going to be known that way. How about this? Your name's mud. His name's mud. That doesn't literally mean that their name is mud. But to call somebody's name mud or to say in the name of, you know, or whatever, these are other uses of the word name. It's that simple. The Bible says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. None of those is a literal name because his literal name was Jesus. You're going to go ye therefore, and the reason is because all power is given unto me, he says, in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father, he says, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's what it says in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. These three are one. The Father's name is clearly Jesus. Jesus is clearly the Father. There's no way around it. It's what the Bible teaches. And if I could have demonstrated that to you one time, that proved my point. Because, you know, this is where people get really, really weird. And I believe that there is a distinction between the Father and the Son, okay? You know, uh, Brother Baker got fired because he, pastor asked him, he said, do you believe that Jesus is the Father? And he said, yes. So, you know, is Jesus talking to himself? Well, look, my friend, there's only one God, okay? Ultimately, he's talking to himself. Say. You are still baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus, whether you know it or not, because you're saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're just not saying the name. Because the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost that it's referring to is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ultimately, he is talking to himself. I don't have a problem with that. That makes perfect sense to me. Okay, I talk to myself. Does that make, you know, I mean, does that mean that I'm two people? If God has three different minds and three different wills, then which one of them is talking here? Okay? It doesn't make any sense to say that God is three different persons. Okay? The Bible says, in fact, the Bible doesn't say that God is three different persons. You'll never find that. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us, notice, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And this can't be God talking to the angels or anything because the angels are not in God's image. He says, let us make man in our image. And plus that's debunked in the next verse because it says, so God created man in his own image. Notice the singular. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So right here, it's let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then it's so God made it in his image. One God that is made up of three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And so that's why that conversation can even make sense. Let us make man in our image. So, you know, if these three persons of the God have all have different minds and different wills, then this just doesn't make any sense, okay? But I believe there's only one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. You know, I believe that Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven. The man that was on this earth, the man Christ Jesus, ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And somebody could say to me, well, you believe that he's seated by himself? You know, he's seated not right next to himself. I do believe that. I believe that God was seated beside God. I believe that, you know, Jehovah was seated beside Jehovah. I believe that Jesus was seated beside Jesus. I do believe that. Just like I believe that God prayed to God. Jehovah prayed to God, to Jehovah. I believe that Jesus prayed to the Holy Father. And that name that he was praying to, he's clear that the name of the Holy Father is Jesus. And you say, well, I'm not convinced. I think you're twisting the scriptures, or I think maybe there's another way to interpret that. Jesus Christ is him that sitteth upon the throne. That's Jesus Christ, okay? 
And Jesus Christ is coming to Jesus Christ to take the book out of his hand. You say, well, that's stupid. I don't believe that. That doesn't make any sense. <sighs> like, how much evidence do people need? I mean, how many more scriptures do you require? If I can prove one time that Jesus is the Father, then I've dismantled the, the argument for the Trinity that they're all three separate persons. It just takes one time. I don't need 20 verse. I don't need to prove it 20 different times. I need to prove it one time. I don't know if people don't understand that or what. Okay? And the Father is, or, I'm sorry, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and, you know, the Father is not the Holy Ghost. And that's the distinction that the Trinity makes. And uh, I'm going to go through here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show why I no longer believe that particular distinction. I'm going to show, because if I can demonstrate one time that the Father is the Son, well, then that's disproven. If I can demonstrate one time that the Holy Spirit is the Son, or that the, you know, the Son is the Father, the Father is the Son, any way, then that is disproven. But what you have to understand is that you can never just base your whole doctrine on one verse and turn the rest of the Bible on its head. That's exactly what the work salvationists do with James 2. And these people keep saying, well, if I can just show you one verse... Then, 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 you know, then case closed. No, wrong. Because you know what? I could show you one verse on getting baptized for the dead. The Mormons have a verse that they point to. I could show you one verse on work salvation. But guess what? They'd both be out of context. I could show you all kinds of things using one verse because heresy is always based on one verse that's twisted and taken out of context. No, no, no. When you have a hundred verses saying one thing or a thousand verses saying one thing and then you have one verse, you can't just say, well, here it is. When the Bible says here, his name shall be called, it lists the attributes. He has the attributes of God. He has the attributes of the Father. He represents the Father. He came in his Father's name. He's the image of the invisible God. That's what it means. Now, another example of this that I thought was a pretty good illustration is that of an ambassador. Jesus represented God the Father because it said, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He hath declared him. Okay. Think about an ambassador from another country. They represent that country. They've come in that country's name. They have the attributes of that country. And if they were in the United Nations, and we said, Saudi Arabia got up and walked out of the meeting. People say that. Or America got up and left the meeting. You know, China wouldn't even sit through the meeting. Iran walked out when they said that. Why? Because that is the ambassador, the representative. So if you're just going to take this one verse and turn the whole rest of the Bible on its head, then you just hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more because we believe in the Trinity here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6, and I'm going to start reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times, referring to Jesus Christ, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So he's going to show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who's the King of kings and Lord of lords? Who comes back and, you know, and, and has King of kings and Lord of lords written upon his garment? Jesus, of course. Speaking about Jesus, his times, he's going to show that. It says in verse number 16, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Now this is what I want you to pay attention to. Watch what it says. Whom, referring to Jesus, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The Bible clearly is speaking about Jesus Christ here. There's no way to be able to say, well, the, yeah, a couple of verses before that it was talking about Jesus, but now it's not. There, 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 you know, there was no other new subject that was entered in, no other new noun that was entered in here. Um, you know, I had close friends that already believed the same as me at that time about that subject, and I, I, I talked to them about it, obviously, still, and, you know, I... That, probably, that wasn't right, and I apologize for that. And then also, uh, this subject particularly, too. Um, the truth is that I, I never went around and, and just taught this just to everyone, though. I, I can promise you that. 
but and 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 I wasn't the only one when I when I found the, the first verse that I found was the verse in First Timothy six that said no man hath seen uh, the Father no man hath, or no man hath seen Jesus it was talking about whom no man hath seen nor can see and that puzzled me. Here's the Tyler Terrian view of this of this chapter. It says, here's what they're saying. They're saying that in verse 16, when it says, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. They're saying that to whom no man has seen nor can see is Jesus. So Tyler walked away from this verse and said, no man has ever seen Jesus. Yeah. That's what he said. It's in his video. He said, this was the moment that set him to question the Trinity and led to him rejecting the Trinity and embracing modalism. This verse. Because he said, no man has ever seen Jesus and no man can see Jesus. Now, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's just like, yeah, they did. That which we have seen and heard, our hands have handled him. Right. They, they put the, you know, they touched him, they saw him, they ate with him, they drank with him. But no, no, no. And he said, man, back when I used to believe in the Trinity, I used to use that verse, no man had seen God at any time. And I would say, hey, that's the Father. Nobody's ever seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. But Tyler said, then I read this verse, and it's saying that nobody's ever seen Jesus. And that's when I realized that Jesus is the Father. Jesus. You know, it's, it's funny, too, that uh, so many people, when they baptize, they say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is the name of the Lord Jesus, whether they say it or not. And then they say this, buried in the likeness of his death, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, because it's Jesus, raised the walk in newness of life. Jesus only. I baptize you in the name of Jesus, sir in the name of does not mean that there's one name for all three. It actually means by the authority of, on account of, or representing, or on behalf of. Okay, that's what in the name of means. So when the Bible says to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it's not one specific name. It's saying you're doing it on behalf of the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. You're doing it representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're doing it by their authority. Right now, um, so when it says there, excuse me, before I move on, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I believe that that's telling you to baptize you in the name that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost have. Because they have one name, just like they had Jehovah, just like they had God Almighty. And his new name, now that he's glorified, you're supposed to go and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was baptized in the name of Jesus. I better jump right in. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7 is probably the most famous verse on the Trinity. And we're going to start reading in verse 6. The Bible says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the famous verse. These three are one. Then it says in verse 8, and, these, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Now let's just get our bearings here, first of all. What does the Trinity teach, and what does this modalist oneness teach? heresy teach. Well, the Trinity teaches that there's one God who is composed of or made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But they are three that are distinct one from another. Modalism or oneness doctrine teaches that there's one God, and he is just one spirit, one entity, who just reveals himself in different modes. So he'll reveal himself as the Father, as the Son, as the Holy Ghost. Those are just three different modes. And it's sort of like I'm a husband, a pastor, and a father, but I'm the same person, but I'm just acting in three different capacities. 
or uh, the, the illustration that these heretics were using was, it's like a one-man band. It's just God picking up a different instrument and using a different instrument. You know, he's the guitarist, then he's the drummer, then he's the whatever. But that's a lie. That's a false doctrine. The Bible is very clear that the Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Ghost. The Son is not the Holy Ghost. That the Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Now, these three are one, and they together, collectively, comprise one God, made up of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We, in the image of God, are also a trichotomy because we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. So, if I were to die right now, the spirit and the soul would depart my body, and there'd be nothing but a body laying here, right? And if the police came to you and said, would you identify this body? And you said, that is Steven Anderson, you would be accurate. But yet, if I walked up to someone in heaven and I was introduced in the soul, in the spirit, as this is Steven Anderson, that would also be accurate. But yet, is the soul the body? Is the body the soul? No. Is the soul the spirit? No, the Bible talks about dividing the soul and, and spirit asunder. So these three collectively make up Stephen Anderson, but they are distinct from one another. They are separate from one another. They're not equivalent to one another. Same thing with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They collectively make up only one God, but they are distinct and different one from the other. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Watch this. Also of your own selves. So he's talking to a group of elders. He's talking to a group of preachers. And he says, you know what? Even amongst your own selves... He said, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So he's saying that even amongst preachers who seem to be doctrinally sound, who seem to be good guys, he's saying even amongst you guys, some of you guys are going to start teaching perverse things. They're going to rise up. And he says they're, they're grievous wolves is what they are, wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, that there were also false prophets among the people, even as there shall be among you, who will privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So I know this is shocking to people who maybe didn't grow up in church or you haven't really been around that long, But this is not the first time that this has happened, and this is not going to be the last time where you think that somebody's doctrinally sound, you think that somebody believes like us, you think that somebody believes the truth, and they start going into heresy and preaching lies. That's what we're looking at here. That's what we just experienced. You know, I mean, obviously, I should not have been going around talking to people about this at all. I should have kept my mouth shut. But I want to say, you know, that I am sorry about talking, talking about this to people, and I did break my promise, and I, and, I, and I truly do feel bad about that.